my daddy sure do know how to calm me down. <laughs> to all of God's children, to Dr. Moody, the visionary of this whole event, to the musician who calmed my soul, thank you. I greet you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. If everyone has their blueprints for salvation, would you please turn with me to the book, the gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 13 through 31. And I'm reading from the Message Bible because I like the way it sounds. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? He said, what happened? They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. It is now the third day since it happened, but now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen the vision of angels who said he was alive. So my friends were off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said. But they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? So he said, stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening. The day is done. So he went in with them. And here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open eye, wide open, they recognized. And then he disappeared. Are you lost? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, we thank you for this moment right now. Like John, I decrease so that your son Jesus Christ may increase. Let all said and done be to the glory of you and that Jesus be lifted up. I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. Ask somebody next to you, are you lost? Are you lost? I've always loved the story, but never understood why this particular resurrection appearance is so much richer in detail than those in other accounts. In my opinion, this is one of Luke's most vivid and dramatic accounts. The account begins with Cleopas and his companions setting out in a state of anxiety or even depression. They have lost their savior and don't know what to make of the reports that his corpse has vanished. They are in a state of disbelief. This is the state in which they meet the risen Christ, in their state of disbelief, in their state of stress, whom they fail to recognize. As they proceed along the way, Jesus explains the scripture to them. There can be no doubt that they know the text as all good Jews do. But they have failed to understand the scripture's significance. Finally, they arrive at the destination, and at the meal, Jesus gives blessing and breaks the bread. At this point, they recognize the Lord, but the Lord is no longer visible. It was not until Jesus had broken bread with Cleopas and his companion that their eyes were open, and he recognized who he was. Are you lost? A stranger drew alongside them. Isn't it odd? how we can so often find ourselves un unburdening ourselves to a complete stranger. 
How many times on a bus or on a train or at a party have you blurted it all out to someone you've never met before and are never likely to meet again? Perhaps that's part of the attraction. We will never meet them again. And so our honesty about ourselves and our lives and those around us will have no comeback, no repercussions, and we will never be held accountable for what we said. But just for the length of that journey, or as long as the party lasts, that person, that confidant, is a valuable companion walking alongside us. As they walk, their companion begins to explain the scriptures for them, pointing out the footprints of God through the history of their people, and especially the footprints of God that will lead to the coming of Jesus into the world. Then he went over them again and explained what the coming of God into the world must be like. Not coming in power and might and majesty, but coming into the world that embraced the whole human life experience. Fear and loneliness, suffering and pain, and yes, even death. To me, what makes the story so remarkable is how unremarkable it really is. I can understand Jesus appearing to the disciples, to the faithful women who follow him, and even to Paul, all very practical appearances in terms of establishing the church and its mission. But the story resonates a little bit deeper. It has the sense of the church and its mission and the tremendous power of the word and its sacraments to connect us with the presence of God. But what stands out to me is not just this, but that it's a story of a God who will not leave us alone. When we are hurt and disappointed, even when it seems that the brightest and the best in life has been destroyed, God will not leave us alone. The death of Jesus could no more stop God from loving us than the night can keep the sun from rising in the morning. In moments when we least expect it, the sounds of soft footprints come up behind us. We turn around wondering who it could be. Then we hope that no one caught us, maybe looking foolish. Have you lost something? And those times when we're not necessarily trying to be religious, we feel his presence at the table. Like the two disciples, we try to get away from it all. In Emmaus and on our way, Jesus comes unexpected and uninvited and vanishes as quickly as he comes. Have you lost something? The reason why I love this is because Jesus cannot be held down. He cannot be possessed any more than he can be confined to the tomb, to the grave, to what they thought would be the end of salvation. But I came to proclaim this to you, that when the soul rolled away, there was power in it. And when the soul rolled away, it was not rolled away for Jesus to get out, but for us to come in. He didn't need to roll away the soul to show that he had all might and power in his hand. He needed the wrong way to sow so that we may have the opportunity to come and find him. The road to Emmaus is also a symbol of God seeking 